Transportation Department announced plans today to require installation of airbags starting in 1972. In an era when auto accidents were killing 1,000 a week, airbags were a high-tech solution, promising to protect drivers from the carnage on America's highways. Show me anybody in this country who would rather go into steel and glass in an automobile collision instead of a cushioned airbag. But automakers fiercely resisted installing the devices, claiming they were too expensive and too experimental. Certainly it's not economical to spend a lot of advertising dollars on the airbag that people don't want anyway. It was a battle that spanned nearly three decades and seven presidencies. There aren't a great many arguments in this country which can get any more heated than those about the safety of cars and driving. In the end, airbags not only became standard, but helped launch a technological revolution, which has made driving more automated and safer than ever. But as cars themselves do more of the driving, how smart is too smart when it comes to keeping us safe? You can see the car just slammed on its own brakes. It was the 1960s, Detroit's golden age, when the car was America and America was the car. Detroit town, that's where the cars are. Detroit was king. The economy was based around the American automobile and uh, things that uh, could impact the sales of that automobile it didn't receive a lot of attention. The focus at that time all the marketing, all the effort was on the sex appeal, the speed, the power, and no emphasis on safety. Yet getting behind the wheel back then was risky. 52,000 people a year were dying in auto accidents. We've lost more Americans on the highways than we've lost in all the wars that we've ever fought. And so many of those losses have been young people. Texas collision takes five lives, crash kills six on Chicago Highway, and on and on through In 1965, a young Washington lawyer named Ralph Nader wrote a book, Unsafe at Any Speed, which accused Detroit of designing cars that were outright dangerous and of ignoring technology that would make them safer. The auto industry didn't want to mention auto safety because it didn't want to alarm people, it didn't want to give the image of their beautiful vehicles of ever being in bloodied crashes. We protected pottery and shipping pottery far more safety than we did human beings in those days. Ralph Nader has launched a new attack against General Motors. And Nader often pointed the finger at GM, the biggest automaker in the U.S. The company responded by trying to intimidate him. GM had a hidden practice of putting private detectives on anyone who criticized them prominently to find dirt, to find a way to shut them up. Because I was a bachelor, they tried to trap me with uh, attractive women. It was almost out of some slapstick movie. Public outrage over GM's tactics and the industry's safety record prompted President Johnson to sign legislation in 1966 that led to a revolution in auto safety. Nader had become a hero and every new car sold in America would now have standardized safety devices like seatbelts. But there was one big problem. An estimated 70% of all motorists do not use lap or shoulder belts. And so Nader pushed a promising new safety device, the airbag. Seatbelts require an action by the passenger or driver, whereas airbags don't rely on driver or passenger behavior. And that's why they're superior. Federal officials believe the airbag is one of the most promising means of cutting down the 55,000 traffic deaths a year. By 72 or 73, the airbags will be mounted in the steering wheel and the rest of the car protecting everybody. But by the early 1970s, the automakers were fighting back, hard. They argued that airbags were unproven and customers would balk at the extra cost. Nader vented his frustration to Congress. The major safety features put in automobiles went in in 67 and 68, and there's hardly been a whit of progress since then, when there should be more progress. It turned out that at a private meeting at the White House in 1971, Detroit had been flexing its political muscle over the airbag requirement. Lee Iacocca raised the issue with Nixon 
about can't you do something about this airbag nonsense? Seat belts were enough, airbags were ridiculous. And that started the whole process of delay year after year, year after year. Airbags were going nowhere until in 1977, the Carter administration ruled that they or automatic seatbelts begin appearing in all new cars in 1982. But the next administration had other ideas. The automobile industry was overjoyed today at the latest Reagan administration rollback on federal regulations, an announcement it was abandoning the requirement for airbags or automatic seatbelts altogether. This is a very tragic day for the American motorist. In 1983, Nader was vindicated when the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the requirement for airbags or automatic seatbelts be reinstated. Within a few years, Chrysler and others began installing airbags in some models. It's been a long time coming, but the automobile airbag has finally come into its own. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader looking on as Ford introduced airbags as standard equipment on the 1989 Lincoln Continental. Three, two, one. And it's been a 19-year fight. It just shows you got to have persistence when you're dealing with the likes of General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. We knew it was only a matter of time before you began having side and rear protection, sort of like a enveloping cushion that protected people from crashes on the highway. By the mid-1990s, tens of millions of cars were equipped with airbags, saving an estimated 1,200 lives. The Acura legend is more than a luxurious choice. And selling cars. It's also a rather safe one. But it soon became clear that automakers and regulators had overlooked a serious risk to children. Airbags can also kill. The force of passenger side airbags, designed to cushion 165 pound adults, proved deadly for dozens of children. The airbag was not child friendly. They were being killed in low speed accidents, which anyone else would walk away from. They ended up creating an airbag that killed the most vulnerable in our society. All of us, the federal government and the industry, uh, have failed to move as timely as we could. The solution called for more software, more sensors, and a complex algorithm to determine who was sitting in the passenger seat. Grown men, highly trained engineers, are throwing plastic dolls around car interiors to develop an advanced airbag, one that can sense the weight of the front seat passenger and how far they are from the dash. I can tell you, during this time, myself and my colleagues were working 70-hour weeks, almost nonstop. Engineers developed the next generation of airbags. We went from crude electromechanical, single-stage driver-passenger systems in 1992 to a full-blown, does-everything-for-everybody, dual-stage, advanced airbag, smart airbag system in 2001. Technology had won, and smart airbags were finally much safer for all occupants. By 2014, some models had as many as 11 airbags. Even the seatbelt has one. But problems persist. 14 million cars have been recalled for faulty airbags that could explode, and 33,000 people a year still lose their lives to auto accidents, the leading cause of death for young people in America. The sheer numbers of people we're saving is amazing with the system. But the airbag technology really has plateaued. Ultimately, we're going to need a, a, not an evolution, but a revolutionary change. And that revolution is coming from the same kind of sophisticated technology that developed the smart airbag. While radar sensors monitor the traffic around the car. Embedded sensors and computer chips are now helping drivers avoid accidents. These and other electronic gadgets have transformed cars into computers on wheels, with some containing more software code than an F-35 fighter jet. We're talking about a level of sophistication, a level of testing that is beyond almost anything you'll see in any other commercial product or military defense product for that matter. All this sophistication comes at a cost. Cars are now being recalled for electronic and software glitches at the rate of a million a month. Software problem. A software problem. A software glitch can cause those vehicles to shift into neutral on their own. 
some of these glitches have not only prevented airbags from deploying, but caused cars to do everything from shut down on the highway to accelerate uncontrollably. It was 35 minutes of sheer terror. And in the case of Chris and Michelle Serino's 2005 Honda Pilot, slam on the brakes without warning. You could hear the groaning noise when every time the brakes are applied, I just came to a complete stop. You'd never touch the brake, which was the weirdest part of the whole thing. You see the car lurching forward again repeatedly. We were not in control of when those brakes would slam on, and it was that was very frightening. It got to the point where we just didn't feel safe with our kids in the car. We got lucky that it that we didn't get killed. Honda ultimately found several flaws in its vehicle stability assist system, which caused the brakes to suddenly engage. The errors were so widespread, the company had to recall more than half a million of its vehicles. Every manufacturer is trying to come up with some new wrinkle in terms of keeping us all safe. But in the pursuit of safety, are we making things so complex that maybe are we making things not as safe as they should be? Essentially, your car becomes just another extension of your digital lifestyle. But defects aren't the only issue. As cars become less Detroit and more Silicon Valley, they are becoming just another device on the internet. Always on, always connected, a tempting target for hackers. Tesla cars are being targeted for possible security flaws. New research shows that the Tesla can be located and unlocked remotely by hackers. They can get in through your tire sensor, your CD player, your Bluetooth connection. A car is about as secure as your PC is. And just as full of your personal data, which allows auto companies to know intimate details about you and the car you drive. We tend to think of the inside of our cars as being private, but as we start to move to a digital world in cars, there's much more data that's generated and collected. And once that data exists, other companies spring up that find a way to monetize it and want to use it. Imagine your car could sense your desires. Cars are sort of the last anonymous way to travel, and we're about to lose that. Automakers, insurance companies, and marketers are all investing heavily to capitalize on the stream of personalized data coming off each car. Turning your ignition key will soon mean a whole lot more than you ever imagined. What if you had the ability to peer into the car from anywhere in the world using an Intel phone? What if we could identify different drivers with face recognition automatically? We're all going to be under constant surveillance and whether someone decides to use that data and how they decide to use that data will be opaque to us. We will look back and say, boy, remember what we were concerned about, and it will seem quaint. Obviously, airbags and seat belts, these were really significant changes in terms of uh, protection of motorists. The question today is, are we gonna spin off into more and more remote, what I call Silicon Valley, electronic trivia. Automakers say the promise of the technology far outweighs the risks, and they are rapidly approaching the automotive holy grail, cars that can drive themselves. 45 years after the fight over airbags began, engineers say they can finally see the day when the airbag will become obsolete. Imagine never losing someone to a traffic accident again. When self-driving cars are a reality, it's, it's going to be amazing. This is a huge opportunity to save lives and make the world a better place.